what the barbarians were like? Study them. You want to know why the Celts still get drunk on St. Patrick's Day? We call the Celtics, that is the Irish. Study their history. They used to get drunk sometimes, get mad at one another, and the middle would cut off the head of the other one and take the skull and put wine in it and drink it. And then when he got really, really drunk, he'd go and have sex with a man. You know what a man is, right? That's a female horse. <coughs> oh, yeah. You know, you get, you know, I, when, when we do these types of things, you'd be like, oh, no, don't tell me that. <laughs> you can't be serious. But they'd go around and make myths up about us that we were cannibals and we ate people. When the earliest recognition of cannibalism comes from France, among the Gauls. Africans didn't eat people. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't really know about humans. You understand? Know but what we thought, because you see, a lot of times when they come from is they twisted a myth, they twisted a story around. You know, sometimes they would take Africans up and through the door and no return. They get up on them ships, right? And they used to cook up on the deck. They had a big pot up there for them. We thought they were going to eat us. We didn't know. We knew that these people were crazy. We had never seen them before. And we thought that we thought they were going to eat us up. They twisted the story around and say that we was eating people up. That's not. Really sad, sad thing where they twist history. Anyway, next slide. Next slide. So, the best known of these writings are the Apostolic Fathers, otherwise known as Church Fathers, and these were Christians living in the early second century whose writings were considered authoritative. And there are many of them, Augustine, Cyprian, Tertullian, Origen, who were all African. Papias, Polycarp, Irenaeus, Dionysius, Athanasius, Rufinius, Gregius of Niaza, Cyril, Ignatius. Just a mission of freedom with lots of them. We need to, you know, really devote some time to studying them. Next slide. New Testament problem. We don't have the original copy of any of the books of the New Testament or the first copy of them or the copies of the first copies of them. All right? What we have are copies made much later, in many cases, hundreds of years later. And this is known because they are available thousands of copies. And you know how dangerous that can be when you have thousands of copies again. These are not Kinko copies. All right? But they all do because they're not. All right? In fact, as you see at the bottom, they differ a lot. And in fact, there are some 5,000 Greek copies of the New Testament that are known. And no two of them are actually alike in all the details. Next. These differences total hundreds of thousands. And there are more differences in the various manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Think about that. <laughs> For example, the last 12 verses of Mark are talking about are not found in the oldest verse. The adulterous woman in John's Gospel does not appear in regular copies until the Middle Ages. Jesus' sweating blood in Luke's Gospel does not appear in some of the oldest and best copies. Contrary to what some might expect, it was not until the year 3767, uh, almost 250 years after the last New Testament book was written, that any Christians recorded named our current 27 books as the authoritative scriptures. Let's go to the next one. I want to show you the layout. These are your history of the time. I told you about Marcion, right? And these are the books we have in here. Then we have Irenaeus. By the way, Irenaeus selected Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to be the Gospels because for no other reason than that, there were four winds in the heavens. That's it. North, south, east, and west. That's it. I bet you thought it was something different. They were out to start they walked with Jesus on. Irenaeus picked that just for that reason, because they're four winds in the heavens. Look it up. If you go read his work, you'll tell Right? The Muratonian canon, which came around 200, was the closest one. Then Eusebius. Eusebius was the, uh, um, was the court historian to Constantine. Eusebius, in his own writings, what is called the uh, uh, Ecclesiastica Histoire, right, or the church history, which is the only original uh, writing on the church history, actually himself admits that he wrote, told lies, damn lies, and the end of it. And if it didn't fit the imperial history, he excluded it from the history. So he made up stuff. All right, but then when you quote the story, you can do that. I told you about Josephus early on, right? When you quote the story, you got to do that. You can't write stuff against the emperor. You can't get salary. You need and stuff. All right, so that's the point. Go to the next one. All right, here's the New Testament as we have it from under Athanasius. Athanasius every year used to do what he called an Easter, uh, um, an Easter sermon. 
and which he would talk about some type of thing. Sort of like what the Pope does today, as we get it from where every year he would come out and make some encyclical or something about something important. Where he decided that these are the 27 books that people ought to use in the canon of the Western Church. It was not agreed upon at any council at any time. It had never been agreed upon. It has just been accepted out of tradition. And it's stuck. But they didn't have a council where they said, okay, these are the books we want to select. They didn't do that. They just went with what he had right there. And this is 367. I want you to keep something in mind. This is 367. If we accept the fact that uh, year one, which was invented by Dionysius Exiguus, because at the time he decided to make year one, uh, it was already four years off. So again, you know, if we think it was a year, uh, 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 what is this year, uh, uh, 2010, by, by, the, by the European calendar? Well, guess what? 2012 is long gone. I hate to tell you. And we still here, as I told you. God is notorious for making men corrupt. And he went off by four years then. And, and this is not a secret. Everybody knows it. Right? But nobody's worried about it, right? But I want you to keep something in mind. If this was finalized in 367, suppose 367 years after the day you who are hearing this lecture right now by me decide to tell my story 40 years later. What do you think you're going to do? Yeah, I thought so. I hear you thinking. All right? Next. The historical Jesus problem. All right? The historical Jesus problem is really, really big issue, right? Because apart from what certain Christian writers have said about Jesus very long after the fact, what do we actually know about the historical figure uh, that was supposed to have walked the earth? Most historical sources about Jesus do not derive from eyewitnesses, but from later authors reporting rumors and traditions they had heard. Now, you know how that goes, don't you? All right, we have rumors and traditions that people have heard, right? We have, we have stories in our families, don't we, that have really blown up from when they originally were, and, and the source is, is pretty much gone now, all right? And uh, if we just look at the sources written within 100 years of his supposed death, this is before the year 130, what will we find about him? This is especially interesting when we look at what his own contemporaries had to say about him. Strangely enough, they said almost nothing. You mean tell me Josephus who was there when the temple was being destroyed at the time when Jesus was supposed to exist mentioned nothing about him? What's up with that? Next. What we do hear about him essentially comes from people like Pliny the Younger, whose father Pliny the Elder was killed during the destruction of Pompeii because he saw the pyroplastic uh, 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 explosion coming over the sea and he didn't know what was going on, so he wanted to go back. We got his navy together, they all ran and then they all died. All right? Suetonius is the 12 seasons, a very classic book. If you don't have it, you should get it. Because this tells you the history of all those Roman emperors and what they did and so forth. And in that case, they talk about somebody called Christ. Uh, Tacitus and his annals, of course, mentions Pontius Pilate and somebody named Crestus who was executed by the procurator Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. All right, of course, in our story that we have in the Old Testament, it says it happened in the reign of Herod. Now, either it, what is it? Obviously, Tacitus would be more trustworthy. All right, now, the problem is that the word Crestus and Christo are two different things. Um, I think I can move this here, right? Okay. So let's take a look at the two words. First, I'm going to give you Christ, and then later on, I think I got another example of Christmas. All right, now. You good? I'm good? Okay, now. Christos. Let's teach you a little history here. In Greek, means to anoint, to pour oil upon. When Constantine, had, when he had his battle at the Melvan Bridge, he said he had a vision of the sky and thought he had saw this, this cross. Well, it wasn't this. We're going to get the history of that later on. What it was, was this. What is called the high road. Now, Microsoft. In the early days, before it came out with the version of Microsoft that we know of today as XP, wanted to initially call their software Cairo. But that was kind of deep because it would involve some religious kind of implications. And so what they did was called it XP. That's how we get it. If you didn't know, as Biggie would say, not really. All right. 
So that's very, very important uh, to understand. Okay, next, Josephus, probably Josephus. I want to talk about this because I think I mentioned a little about, a bit about the problem of Flavius Josephus and who he was and where he went, so I can pass by that slide, all right? Let's move on. And with that, we can move on. And I throw this up. This is a uh, bird and child in Christ, Christ of Salamanca in Spain. I saw this when I was a student in Spain, and it blew me away when I was in the cathedral. Because I was just walking around, checking out the various cathedrals and stuff in, 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 while I was in Spain, particularly while I was in Sevilla and when I went to Salamanca. And I walked around, I saw these people, there was a lot of them, they were standing there worshiping. And I'm like, you know, because they got, because of the cathedrals like that, they got little worship spots all around them. Not like here where you go into the Catholic Church and they got one sanctuary. They got many of them in these Catholic churches. And so I go down looking, all these people are standing around there praying to this black Jesus. I was like, I gotta have this. And I did have a slab of many years ago, and I, of course, I ultimately found it back on the internet again. That's it. But there are black Madonnas all over you. All over you. The black Madonna of Krakow, Poland, right? right? We know about this. But, they're, and they're all over. And only here in the United States do people still think that the Madonna and the child is white. The earliest form, of course, of Isis on Osiris. I mean, Isis and Horus, which we all know. All right? Next slide. Here's a copy priest. He would call him on the number, and of course, an example of Paul from uh, the Coptic Church. Because, see, as far as the cops are concerned, all of the biblical figures are black. You know, they just can't see them as being something like that. Go ahead. All right, here's an example of some actually actual black in, uh, in African stuff who are oh, what we call Hebrews, Israelites, or whatever name you want to use for them. <coughs> all right, let's move on. All right, some migration routes and stuff like that. We see uh, these people, of course, uh, Joseph Williams, he was in the West Africa, has always been a very, very popular book related to this, but there are many, many others. Go ahead. Uh, Nath Hamadi, for the dead, where, where, the, uh, where the Coptic texts were found, is very, very important. Of course, we always, again, one of the things you learn about when you study this literature is that everything brings you back to Egypt. What really got me involved in the study of this, I like to tell people all the time, is that if it was, was not for my study of Tanakh, I would not be studying Egypt. I was curious. I wanted to know, Egypt comes up all the time in this book. So what's up with Egypt here? All right? I ain't never read Germany or Poland, or England, or Great Britain as they call it, or, or, or France or Spain, but certainly, I read about Egypt, right? It's very important we're talking about here, Nagamadi down there. Now, Nagamadi notice right down there in the area that we refer to as Egyptian New. All right, where the temples are, Luxor, Karnak, Dendur, and all these places, how many of us are All right, Nagamadi Caves. You know, again, same situation happened, this was in 1945. Father walked along, had a donkey, donkey fell into, stumbled into a hole, found a whole bunch of these ancient texts, which we knew about, man, from the works of people like Bishop Irenaeus, and they all wrote, all these people wrote about what these people were saying, but there was no proof of it until relatively recent, in 1945. And here was the problem. When the scrolls from non Hamadi were found, the church, just like what happened with the DSC scrolls tribe, everything in the power to suppress it. Because now the truth had come out about the other side of Christianity that the Africans had that they didn't want people to know about. And now it's beginning to be known. And now, of course, the literature is out there. Go ahead. So, this is the copy alphabet. Right here, uh, Brother Benanti now we're talking because he talked to his sister, uh, uh, Riketti, Riketti Amin Wimpy, who is one of my dear, dear friends. We've been knowing each other for ages. And also a person who I recognize as one of my teachers. Uh, you know, I'm one of the people who actually introduced her to this community because we were, a, her, her sister was a very close friend of my ex-wife's. And one day, her sister was by the house and I was studying. And she was like, you know, my sister does that kind of stuff. I'm like, really? She said, yeah, my sister does that. I said, well, next time you come through, why don't you bring your sister with you? And so, the next time she comes through, she brings her sister. Now, some of you all probably know Sister Riquette. Right, you know she's a real short little sister, very unassuming looking. You never know she's one of the most brilliant 
black women on the planet. You understand? And so she comes in with two shopping bags full of stuff. And yes, I'm telling you the true story, Kate. This is being recorded, so you probably see this. So yeah, I'm telling the story. All right. And she come in with these two shopping bags full of stuff. And she sits them down in the living room. She says, "Do you want to have this conversation in Chinese, Hebrew, or Arabic, or French?" Wow. <laughs> I'm like, what? Because you know the sister is fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Got her master's degree in Chinese literature and language. Way back before people were even seriously, everybody talking about now you need to know some Mandarin Chinese, right? That's the big thing now in business. She had already been doing that. Plus she spoke French. I actually got the first copy of Civilization of Barbarism that she translated from French into English. Before it was translated into English. So, you know, she bad. And then, you know, when she was over at OI, uh, at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, of course she was studying copy, so I wanted to learn copy, so she taught me copy. You know, we used to have a class and she would teach me copy, you know, and if you ever sat with her, you know she's serious about what she's doing. And so when you one of her students, you better be there and be ready. And so I, I sold them everything she had, and I thank her for that to this day, for what she taught me, all right? Go ahead. Um, so, again, Emperor Constantine, I talked about it after the defeat of Maxentius, which was really his brother, the male Van Bridge, he became Emperor of the West. Uh, and uh, was defeated after the Battle of Chalcedon. Constantine became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. I want you to know something. This man did not become a Christian until he was on his deathbed. Up until that time, he did some of those cruel and vile and vicious things you could ever think of and probably not think of. That he bought his wife and scalded in hot water. Killed his brother. He did some vicious stuff. But anyway, tradition has it that on the day of the Battle of uh, Maxentius, he was on the image of the cross that shows you there in the sky of the high road. By this, by this sign, you shall conquer. This sign was not the traditional cross most people imagine. Uh, this symbol was not accepted until the third century. So when you're wearing that cross around your neck, now you know. All right, next slide. Uh, uh, here we have the high road that I just showed you right there. Well, with the Greek word Christon, which really means good, not anointed, which is Christo, not Christon. And that's what you see in a lot of books. Next slide. All right. This is Ikes, right? Ikes, which sometimes you see. You see people with, like, like with their cars, and they have the fish on the car, and inside of these Greek letters, right? Which are, are really represent Jesus, uh, 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 Christos, Soter, um, um, something, something, I forget the others right now. Excuse me, you can look it up. But it has to do with Jesus Christ, uh, Savior, the Son of God. That's what it looks like. And of course, the, the letter I and J did not become distinguished to the 17th century, so the symbol of the case did not used until the 4th century. Of course, a lot of Catholic priests wear this on their vestments. Next page. The, the Orpheus Baptist. All right? This is very, very important because this is one of the earliest examples that we have of a man on the cross. And this is Orpheus said, Orpheus Bacchus in Greek. Of course, the Orpheus Bacchus, the back of the of a celebration of, of uh, you know, reverie and stuff like that. That's what Bacchus did. If you ever go to Las Vegas, if you ever been to Caesar's Palace, they got in the middle rotunda of Caesar's Palace, they got this big thing of Orpheus Bacchus, and they have a little light show and stuff, and he's around there telling everybody, hey, hey, have a good time and doing up this, you know. Uh, Cup and all that good stuff. But that's part of what Baptist uh, was all about under the Emperor Justinian. If you want to read more about the Emperor Justinian, you, read to, you need to read Procopius, The Secret Histories. This is when he meets Theodora. All right, Theodora, uh, who was a, a, a Scythian princess, he meets her at what, what we would then call in the ancient world the TNA club. You know what the TNA club is, right? Well, that's where she was. She was a dancer in the club. And he just met her, and she must have gave him a lap dance or something. He fell in love with her. I'm telling you the story. You read Procopius' the Secret History. You think I'm making this up? Not. He, he, he said, look, I'm marrying you. I love you. Made her empress. She was a slut. But he made her empress. And one day, when he was being challenged, he wanted to run. <laughs> she told him, she met him. He thought, meet me on the dock with all the gold and everything, and we're going to get out of here. She met him on the dock. And, Gave him a kiss on the cheek and say, hey, baby, sign my son. i sure that's what you want to do, but I ain't leaving. You got to remember, she was for nothing. And she wasn't leaving. You know, this was a serious, as they call it, come up for her. Why is she going to leave this and go run off to him because he's punking out? She was, look, she, look, she was a dancer. She found out somebody else probably did. 
All right, of course, he had decided to stay with her because if he left her, he knew what that meant. Because she was what she was. You know, just like she picked him up, she can pick up another. Let's move on. All right, Emperor Diocletian, very important, instituted the era of the martyrs and the great persecution of the African Christians in Kemet. Either of Milan, I just talked about the Council of Nicaea, I talked about the Third Council of uh, Constantinople is very, very important. Along with Nicaea, Council of Constantinople and Chalcedon are very important because in Chalcedon, the clause, who with the Father and the Son is together worshiped and together glorified, and I see increase and seated. Uh, stressed the worship of the Holy Spirit, which refuted the, con uh, the contrary uh, position held by the Gnostic Apollinarians, also Roman bishops to control the church from Kemetic bishops. That's what happened. And also they established a hierarchy that we know of in the church between bishops, priests, and deacons. And they said that the bishop who stands before you, when he speaks, he speaks to you as if the word of God is coming out of his mouth. And he stands before you as if he were God. That's powerful. Because that means other people who are bishops and stuff like that, when they speak, they have the authority as if God is speaking out of their mouth. And not only that, you are not to question the bishop. Because one of the problems they have with the Gnostics is that the Gnostics believe in inequality. The Gnostics had women who were also priests. And they used to rotate. You know, maybe, you know, the women could do all of the activities. There was complete equality among the Gnosticism. Because in the African worldview, women were not suppressed. Women had equal rights, especially when we talk about Kemet, the only ancient civilization in the world where women had complete and total equal rights. And that's the way they did it, even when they practiced their form of what we call Christianity. That was very important. And also, the Council of Chalcedon, where the two natures of Christ were found to be dissolved, and any other views were suppressed forever. That is, the whole idea that Christ was not only Son, but also God, too, was established at the Council of Chalcedon. Let's go on. I don't want to deal much with this, but you can look at it, uh, the Aryan controversy, because one of the things that happens over, the, over a Greek word, as I put down here, homoousia. Ousia means the essence of a thing, as in, in the nature of its being. And they argued that the debate was really over this Greek word, the question of homoousia, or same essence or being, this meant that humanity had the same divine spark in it. In other words, all people had ousia in them. All people had a Christ in them, but this is how they changed go to the next one. All right? And it was agreed at this conference to change the word from homo usia to homo oi usia. By changing one letter, they came up with the idea, by putting in an iota, they came up with the idea that this person had an identical substance as God, since hence he was God. And that's how we have the idea that Jesus is also God. But if you don't know what happened at these councils and how they made these decisions, you can think that there's just something that fell down out of the heavens somewhere. And as I say, I ain't here arguing with the heavens, I'm arguing with the scribes. All right? Let's move along. All right? So, I talked about the Aryan controversy and the ecclesiastical history. Let me say something about the ecclesiastical, about the word ecclesia. The word ecclesia in Greek, from which we get the word ecclesia, means a gathering together. An ecclesia. We are having an ecclesia right now. In books, in, in the New Testament, they translate that word as church. So we have a church right now, people don't know. But we have an ecclesia. All right, move along. The only, the only difference, I, I think the real only difference between this and church is that when they have an Islamic Bible study here, you're going to be able to ask questions. All right? Let's move along. Next, talk about Gnosticism. You know, I'm going to a little bit, it's part of another lecture I did another time, I just want to do a little bit of stuff, that the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which I showed you before, from Coptic, which comes from ancient Kemetic language, from Nature, the term Coptic is from the Arabic word Quep, all right, Kemet, Duck Tokes and stuff, we talked about that, I think that's some stuff you already know, I'm just going to see you already, go ahead. All right, uh, talk about uh, Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon, and this whole idea of the reputation, the open door of knowledge, and false and call, so false and call, in which he challenged a lot of the ideas of the Gnostics, Go ahead. Uh, and, the, and the whole idea of saving gnosis, which is all about very important the word Sophia. All right, from which we get the word philo Sophia. All right. We look at the word philo Sophia. All right. Philo Sophia. Literally, love 
and wisdom. That's what Sophia means. And notice that wisdom is a feminine word, never a masculine word. Even in Hebrew, the word chakma is a feminine word. Read Proverbs 8. Does not wisdom call and understanding put forth her voice? At the top of the high place, she standeth that way unto you, O man, I call and my voice is unto the sons of men. Check it out. The Hebrew word is all feminine. It's wisdom is always feminine, never masculine. All right? So we have philosophia, and I have to call it not just love of wisdom, but love of the lady wisdom. And then you have philo and delphia, right? Philo, love, delphia, brother, brotherly love, all right? The city of brotherly love, and so forth, all right? So there are many forms of that type of thing. So Sophia was very, 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 very important because Sophia was the quest for wisdom and how one acquired that wisdom, all right? And it was very, very important because it related to the feminine principle. We understand this from comedic literature and the nature of the feminine principle in comedic literature. And so, not, so the people who were called Nazis were nothing but trans, doing nothing but transferring comedic ideas into their uh, this thing we call Christianity. Since the foundation of Christianity, as you should already know, if you don't know, started being given anyway. All right, and all they were doing is expanding. All right, the major theme of uh, Gnosis, uh, Theosophy, elaborating on the transcendent divinity and the divine world, cosmology, how the world came to be. Anthropogeny, uh, and this involves the order and prism of the human being, and soteriology, how the human self can be saved. These were all very important ideas, which were much later on in the Platonic and Neoplatonic thought in Western civilization. Because Plato talks a lot about the whole idea of the one and the many. This is very important to understand because when we talk about the one and the many, we know that I'm and though hidden is the source of all life, all power, and all health, and that the natures are really just various forms of an expression of that identity. All right? So, let's move right along. All right, the cortex is not the mind. All right, we see all of that, move right along. Uh, introduction to Dr. Thomas. I want to get right to the same with Dr. Thomas in particular. Go ahead. Uh, this is it, what briefly come out. Um, the top didn't come out. Here's what it said. Jesus said, because it's called the same God. If those who need you say to you, see the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds will become first before you in the sky. If they say to you, she is in the sea, you can't see that she is in the sea unless you read it in content. Then the fish will become first before you. But the kingdom, she is inside of you. And she is outside of you. When you will know yourself and you will be aware that you are all children of the Father who lives, if you will not know yourself, then you all exist in poverty and you are that poverty. That is from the Gospel of Thomas, one of the most powerful Gnostic texts ever published. There's nothing about Jesus being born or Jesus dying in here, no resurrection, none of that stuff. Just saying. It's wisdom. Go ahead. Yes. Absolutely. Go ahead. All right. Go back. Celsus. I'm going to talk a little bit about Celsius before we go, because I know our time is, is short here and running around. I ain't even covered, I've covered three quarters of what I wanted to cover. All right? So, it says, some believers believe as though uh, from a drunken bout, go so far as to oppose themselves and offer the original text of the Gospels three or four several times over, and they change these characters to enable them to deny difficulties and face criticism. The Christian injunctions are like this. Let no one educated, no one wise, no one sensible draw near. For these abilities are thought by us to be evil, but they talk about the Christians talking to be But as for anyone ignorant, anyone stupid, anyone uneducated, anyone with a child, let him come both. <laughs> Moreover, we see that those who display their secret glory in the marketplace and go about begging would never enter a gathering of intelligent men, nor would they dare to reveal their noble beliefs in their presence. But whoever they see adolescent boys, whenever they see adolescent boys and a crowd of slaves and a company of fools, they push themselves in the to show off. All right? That was Celsius in uh, uh, quoted from the, 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 the true word, what's called the true doctrine, quoted from uh, by origin and against self he quotes it word for word. Okay, go ahead. Alright, uh, I'm going to stop right here because really my time is up. Uh, I need to stop and we're going to have some questions right now, I guess for a minute. But I want to thank you all very much for inviting me and I hope you have that you acquire a little bit Like I said, I'm on page 59, I got 125. <laughs> but, you know, that was a lot to cover. Let's do it again. Yes, sir, we can do that. Yes, sir, bro.
Um, uh, just a couple of uh, quick comments and then questions. Uh, when you talk about homosexuality amongst the Greek, if uh, you know, I do a lot of research as you on my show Thursday, if everybody goes to answers.com, okay, because that's, that's a good tool to start doing research. You go to answers.com and type in Greek homosexuality, it will come up with artifacts showing homosexual acts amongst the Greeks, okay. And it will show acts between adult males and teenage kids. Down at the bottom, there's a uh, down at the bottom there's a link called uh, Pederasty in Ancient Greece. Right. Okay. P E D E R A S T Y. That was an act of adult males and teenage boys. You click on that link, it shows you ancient paintings and artifacts of that as well. Okay. So we really need to research. That, and these are all things that we can easily see, but it's not shown to us. Mm -hmm. okay? um, when you talked about, um, when, you, when you showed the images of uh, the metal netter and top of language, things right. like that, when I had a, a Thursday, I had you on the show, and I had Dr. Booker T. Coleman on, he told me to ask you this question. Why is uh, Greek, the Greek language, not a real language? Right. Good question. Yep. Very good question. Well, first off, the Greek language is really not a, a, a real language because in the etymology of, in, in, the, in the development of what we think of as the so-called Hellenistic language, more properly, uh, they never really had a, a, a vocabulary extensive enough to really consider themselves having a language. In fact, an overwhelming majority, and Dr. Obenga points this out too, which is very true, is that more than half of what we think of as Greek words come from other languages. So they really never had a language. So understand, never having a language meant that with, with that, that, that lack of ability to communicate didn't have, Smith say, says a lot about what they really had to talk about at all. And obviously, they, didn't, they couldn't speak uh, uh, of what we call philosophy. And it's really from From what we, their script actually derives from what we call the Phoenician or Pilean language. Which ultimately derives from the natural, yes. So we have to still go back to the natural, absolutely. In fact, in uh, 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 the last uh, two biblical archaeology reviews ago, they did a thing, an uh, article on the origin of the alphabet, and they actually started with the the earliest forms of the natural that were found in the Sinai, that led to the development of what we think of as uh, the Hebrew script. Yeah, very good, very good article. And a guy by the name of. Um, uh, I brought a couple of books I want to share with you. Uh, one of them, before I forget, is this right here. Look, you have this on there. This is called, this is by Shalom Sam. It is called The Invention of the Jewish People. It is the bomb. <laughs> this man is an Israeli scholar. This book was originally written in Hebrew, only recently put into English, in which he just, ex I first heard about the book by looking at, because I try to read a lot of different foreign uh, papers and press like that, and I saw it in Haaretz, which is one of the Israeli newspapers, and they were talking about the book, and the, this book was on, was spent 15 weeks on the Israeli bestseller list, and yet he destroys them and who they are speaking. One of many books like that. I would also recommend a good reference here, and, and I told him that I wouldn't go, go out with, without talking about Arthur Kessler's The Thirteenth Tribe. Yeah. There are many, many books on the Khazars and Khazari because the history of the Khazars is one of, the, one of those things that is rarely, rarely known uh, in history because when they deal with European history, they don't like to deal with the Khazar empire that lived that exists between the Black and Caspian Sea and how ultimately they came to be known as Jews, that is the Eastern European Jews called the Black the Ashkenazi. And of course, the group they call the Sephardi are also descendants of the Europeans too, contrary to popular opinion of them being some type of Oriental Jews. All right, that doesn't exist at all. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you say, I'll put this in a question, can you say something about the Quran and Islam? Yes. Come in, Mike. Yes, I can. Um, I'm going to, I laid out a couple of things here, and what I want to do is, um, first off, I'm going to read to you a couple of quotes from Islamic scholars about what they thought about blacks. Um, a very good book, and I have him here, but I'm not going to really get into him at this moment, 
is uh, Al Jahiz from the in, the in the Glory of the Blacks. But uh, Ibn Khaldun, uh, whose book the Al